Okay, so our second speaker of the afternoon is Stephen Kudla. He will tell us about theta integrals and generalized error functions. Okay, so let me uh, also begin by thanking Joseph very much for his wonderful influence over the years. I'll wait till Thursday to tell stories, if I can remember any of them that are, could be told. And uh, in any case, thank you very much. And it's a great honor and a pleasure to be speaking here at his birthday conference. So this is really a lot of pleasure. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is a little bit. I need a microphone. What have we yeah, yeah, good. OK, now I can speak less. I can save my voice a little bit. Is it loud enough for everyone? Everybody OK? Yeah, all right. Um, so what I want to talk about today are the theta series attached to indefinite quadratic forms. So this is an ancient uh, subject, the theory of theta functions. And the point, of course, is that if I have a vector space V with an inner product, so this is a symmetric inner product, et cetera, et cetera, let's say over the rational numbers, um, I can talk about the signature. And let's so once and for all assume that the signature is P times Q. You can see there's not going to be any number theory in this talk because P is already used, so it can't be a prime. Could be, I suppose. Um, in any case, the, sig the case of signature P0, now there's a case of positive definite quadratic forms. It's a classical, very, very classical construction where if you have a lattice, let me also fix inside of V a lattice, which is integral, which means this is the dual lattice. L check is the dual lattice, and so this is just saying that the quadratic form takes integer values on the lattice. Um, a typical thing that you would do to form a theta series, I have now also a variable tau, which is U plus IV. Uh, v is greater than zero, so this is in the upper half plane. <clears throat> so I'm making, going to make a modular form. So the standard way of doing this, if in the case of a positive definite form, is to simply sum on lattice vectors. Perhaps you want to take a coset. So I'm going to take a mu, which is a coset in the, of L in the dual lattice. So I'm shifting a little bit. This is traditional. So I sum on lattice vectors x in this coset um, of q to the q of x. So now there's a second Q in play. Uh, this Q, which I'll leave it to you to distinguish from the other one, is e to the 2 pi i tau. And here I am a number theorist because this means, as always, e to the 2 pi i of tau. Um, so it's the number theorist's exponential. So this is what you would do to make a theta series in classical language for a positive definite quadratic form. It converges beautifully. And this would define a quadratic form if I let m, let's say, be the dimension, well, let's say, well, the dimension of V, let's say N is the dimension of V, then this would have weight N over 2. So it's a modular form of weight N over 2 for some subgroup whose level you can determine by looking at the index of L check in L and so on and so forth. So this is a classical theta series. And the question is, what happens and what do you do when the form is indefinite? So let's suppose that P times Q is positive, so that there are some negative and positive directions. And the question is, how do you make an analogous theta series? So this, has an ancient hi this is an ancient problem and uh, has a long, long history. Um, and so there are various ways in which you can try to fix things uh, here. And so what I want to discuss today is some relatively uh, different ways of fixing this, some quadratic, uh, some indefinite theta series uh, so in, theta series attached to indefinite quadratic forms, which have been arising lately in various places in the, I dare say, in physics, in string theory, and other questions in algebraic geometry, counting problems, et cetera, et cetera. These series seem to come up. They're a little different from what's been done up until now. And I want to explain uh, some of the history of the new method, the old method, and then to try to explain how some old work of mine with John Milson actually gives a way of doing the, explaining these new series that are coming up in, in various applications. So that's the, the goal here. So to start out with the history a little more, sort of historic style, um, the, very early in the history of the theta series for indefinite quadratic forms is the work of Siegel. So let me just remind you about that for a moment. Um, so what Siegel did is the following. He looked at uh, the space D which is the set of all z 
inside of VR such that Z is a negative Q plane. Okay? So it's a real negative Q plane. In other words, what I, by that, of course, I mean that simply when I take the quadratic form and restrict it to Z, it's negative definite. And so this D is sitting inside. It's an open subset of the Grassmannian of all Q planes in the real vector, underlying real vector space. And why do we care about these things? Well, of course, the problem with convergence here is that in the case of an indefinite quadratic form, usually there are infinitely many lattice vectors of any given length. That's a problem. Moreover, there are ones of negative length, so then you have negative powers up here. It's even worse. So everything goes wrong. But Siegel's idea was to fix the quadratic form by introducing what he called a majorant. And to do that, and in fa fact here, I'm taking negative Q-planes, but later in the talk, you'll see it's important to take them as oriented negative Q-planes. So I'll, let me introduce that now, once and for all. So D is the oriented negative Q-planes. So you'll, we'll come back and see what the role that plays in a, a little while. Anyway, the majorant, if I have a Z in D, so of course that's just a negative Q-plane, so of course I get a decomposition of my vector space into Z orthogonal direct sum with z perp. And on here, the form is negative definite. And on here, the form is positive definite. So any lattice vector that fell into z perp, we'd be happy with it. So what you do to define the majorant attached to this z is you define a new quadratic form, x, x sub z, which is just x, x. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the sign of the quadratic form on the negative part. I just force it to be positive definite. OK. so. It's useful to have the following quantity. So I'm going to let r of x, z. So x is just a vector in my vector space, v, r, now. And so this is equal to, well, I can project x to my negative q-plane. Just project away from here. Take that component. I can look at the inner product of that projection with itself. So that's now negative. I change the sign. Okay? So that's what r of x, z is. I just, it's the projection into here, and then I change the sign. And now what I'm going to do is I add twice that to the original quadratic form. So you see the net effect is I've simply changed the sign on z, right? Now, of course, there's a whole subspace of this Grassmannian of ways in which you can take a negative q-plane. So there are infinitely many of these things here. And so what, theta, what uh, uh, Siegel decided to do was he defi defined a theta function uh, here. In, in the analogous way, so let me put a mu here. This is just to make it look like representation theory. It feels like it's the highest weight, right? I mean, <laughs> okay. So you sum, again, on vectors in this coset. And now what you do here is you take this major. And so you take, a, um, well, how should I say it? I guess we take e to the minus 2 pi r, sorry, 2 pi v r of x, z. So I'll, I will write bigger in just a minute, sorry, uh, times q to the q of x. So I'm writing it this way because I don't have to remember how to put the tau and the tau bar and so on and so forth in if I write it this way. So all I'm doing is I'm taking, you see in the exponent here, in effect, with respect to the imaginary part, which is what counts, I have changed the sign of the quadratic form So because I'm, I'm seeing this quantity in front of v. And then the u part just goes as, as usual, OK? So you write it this way. You, you may put another minus sign? Still I. There's no i here. There's no, there's no, I, I've already can't, the i and the, the exponential has become the usual exponential, right? Rxz was already negative, right? No, Rxz is positive. Yeah, so I, yeah, yeah, I have a nice positive quantity. Okay. So this is Siegel's, this is Siegel's theta function. Um, now, it, in front, probably you have to put a power of v to get a good transformation law. Um, now the reason I'm putting this in is that you, if we didn't put it in, then the transformation law would have a c tau plus d to the p and a c tau bar plus p to the q, which we don't like because it doesn't look like a classical modular form. Uh, and if we put this in, this has now weight in just the standard theory of modular forms, p minus q over 2. Okay? So c tau plus d to the p minus q over 2. And of course, we're talking about metaplectic things, and there's the multipliers, and so on and so forth. I mean, whatever. It's the usual theory of theta series. 
Well, it's now a function of two variables. We really think of z as another variable. Okay, so that's the, the beauty of this, this theory is that, now of course, you could just have one z and not think about it. That's a mistake. You really should consider the whole space. It's now a function of two variables, one the s upper half plane and one in this symmetric space d. The weight with respect to tau. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for a fixed z, you would have the transformation law, right? Or for each z, for all z, et cetera, right? Yeah. So it has that weight. And of course, the other point about it is that because you have some equivariance properties here, this is also invariant. So this is with respect to, let me put here, with respect to tau. So the usual modular transformation law with respect to tau has weight p minus q over 2. But we also have um, gamma l invariance with respect to z, where gamma L, let me squeeze it in here, is the set of all isometries of my rational vector space, which preserve the lattice. But also, if I look at gamma, if it preserves the lattice, it also preserves the dual lattice. And therefore, it acts in L check modulo L. It acts in this coset space here. And I'm requiring that it act trivially. That way, these cosets are all preserved. Okay? So gamma restricted to L check mod L. In other words, the induced, represent, the induced action on L check mod L is required to be 1. So this is just some mild congruent subgroup, is all it is. So in any case, I get invariance under that, because if I move x by such a thing, I can move the x over, or if I move z by such a thing, I can move it over onto the x. The quadratic form is preserved by gamma, so I can put it inside here as well. And then I just permute the sum around, because I've got this condition. The mu is not changed. So I get this function of two variables, which is somewhat automorphic in both. Um, and as Roger always pointed out to us years ago, I can then transfer automorphic forms from one variable to the other by taking, using this as an integral kernel. And this gives rise to a vast theory of the theta correspondence and so on and so forth. So this is a nice construction. Um, and it really has its roots in Siegel. Now, what uh, back in the day, John Milson and I considered a variant of this where we looked at things which are not valued in functions. This is now a function of z, but are valued in forms, differential forms on d, not functions on d. And I'll come back and discuss that a little bit more. Um, but I should say now that John and I started working when I was at, at Maryland. And when I was at Maryland, Don Zaguer was also there half the time as my colleague. And we discussed indefinite theta series a lot. And so Don had a rather different approach, or wanted to see a different approach developed rather than this, which introduces an extra variable and then some geometry and so on and so forth. He didn't like that so much. So there's an alternative approach. Or to say called an alternative idea. And that is that rather than introducing this extra parameter and a major it, which makes the quadratic, which just forces the quadratic form to be positive definite, and of course, it, notice that this is non-holomorphic. So let's emphasize that. It's important. It's not a holomorphic function of tau now, because the imaginary part is broken out here separately. So this is definitely in for. If p and q, if pq is not 0, it's not a holomorphic function in tau anymore. So that's the disadvantage. In other words, you've gotten convergence, but at the price of losing the holomorphy. OK. So Don's idea that he kept harping on at the time was, well, why do, the other thing we could do is to simply restrict the summation a little bit. So we're summing things holomorphic, but only over some cone of vectors where things are positive, And we could make a nicer theta series. OK, so the idea is to uh, restrict uh, the summation um, to, get, to keep holomorphy and get convergence. Okay? So let me give you an example of how you might do that. So, so as I said, there's sort of a historic root here in the sense that John Milson and I did these things, and we moved off in one direction. Don carried his idea back to Bonn with him, and eventually had a student, uh, Sanders Vegers, who proceeded to realize some of what Don's idea was. And so there's a second stream, okay? 
And so let me just say here as an example, and this is in Swagger's thesis, Okay, so let's look at the case of signature of V is equal to N minus 1, 1. So I've kept the dimension equal to N, and I'm taking a hyperbolic space. Okay, so now D, let's draw a picture of D. What does it look like? Well, of course, inside of this vector space, if I can keep this perpendicular, I can even see it, there's a light cone. And inside of the light cone is, is D itself, which can be identified now with the set of all V in VR, such that VV, the inner product, is equal to minus 1. Okay, Because each oriented line, remember I have oriented negative Q planes. So this means each line, if it's a negative line, has a canonical direction in it, because it's oriented, and therefore hits the hyperbola of two sheets in a unique point, because it's oriented. So D is literally the identified with the union of uh, these two pieces here, these two pieces of the hyperbola. So they're both in play, because of oriented. So there's D. And so now the idea, this is in Zweger's thesis, was to restrict the summation in the following way. So what you do is you choose C and C prime, a pair of vectors in VR, but we're going to require them to, that they are negative vectors. So QC, Q, by the way, I'm going to use it, and I've already used it. Nobody complained, thank you. <laughs> okay, Q of X is one half of the inner product of X with itself. Okay, once and for all. Okay, so I'm going to require that both of these vectors be negative. Okay, so that's fine. But I require one other thing. And that is that I want them to both lie. So they're both lying in this light, inside the light cone somewhere. And I want them to lie in the same nap of the cone. In other words, the same connected component. So typically, for example, I might take one like this and one even longer. So this might be C and C prime. So how do I enforce that other condition? Well, if you think about it, the other condition that they are lying in the same part can be written in terms of the inner product as being negative. Because after all, one example would be C inner product itself, which would be negative. And clearly, C with minus C is positive. So that tells you what the condition is, that, they should, that this inner product of mutual inner product should also be negative. That gives you this picture. Now, why do we care? Well, what we do is we introduce the following function. So phi sub 1, you can guess from the 1 that there will eventually be phi sub something else, of x. And let me also now. Uh, write for convenience of notation script C for this pair. All right? Uh, again, there's going to be more general things later. So, okay. So, uh, phi, phi 1 of x, any vector x and v with this C, is simply one half of the difference of the signs of the inner products of x with these two vectors. Okay? So I look at x dot c, x dot c prime, and I take the difference of the signs of those inner products. Now, what does that do for you? Well, if you think about it, what happens here is that orthogonality here looks rather like it does in Euclidean space, as long as you stay away from the light cone. And so what happens is that you've really defined a pair of planes. This is when x, oh yeah, well, it probably won't help. I think it's that board. Um, anyway. We can define a pair of planes. So this might be the plane given by x c is equal to 0. And there's another plane. Similarly, they'll intersect in some line here. Uh, this other one is given by x c prime equals 0. So those are these two planes. And to say that they have opposite signs, that x has, so of course, this is 0 if they have the same sign. And so to say that they have opposite signs, means you're lying between these two planes, because you're below one and above the other. right? And that's when the signs are different. If you're on the same side of both, you're both plus or both minus. Okay? So the support of this function is this wedge-shaped region lying between these two planes. And if you look at the picture, you see that wedge-shaped region is lying in the positive part of the space. It never meets the light cone, other than 0, which we don't care about. And so what you can do is you can form the following sum. We can, I'm going to use script 
more classical type thing here. Now it's depending on C, because it depends on these vectors, the wedge. So I write the sum on x in mu plus L, as before, of phi 1 of xc times q to the q of x. Notice no majorant. So this is what you, you write down. And then you can check quite easily that this converges. Okay? And defines a nice holomorphic function of tau. And you sort of say, great. But of course, it's not a modular form. So this is holomorphic, convergent, holomorphic, but not, unfortunately, modular. So there's no modular transformation law. OK. So, and of course, anybody could have seen you could make some cones, whatever you want. You can, OK. But the point is now that in, in his thesis, Zweger's found a way of correcting that. Now, what will happen is that you will end up with a non-holomorphic part to make a correction. I mean, that's life. You're not going to get holomorphic. But the point is that you're taking this beautiful series like this, which is defined by cone. It's a q to the q of x. It looks like a classical theta series. And what's going to happen is we're going to add to it a correction to make the whole thing modular. And then you've divided into two pieces, which is then connected with the theory of mock modular forms and various other things that people are interested in these days. OK, so I think I can erase this part. Okay. So let me explain what Swagger's adds on. OK, so here's what you add to make it, make it better, make it modular. Um, so I, at this point, the error, functions, the error function comes in. Okay, um, So th let me just remind you, or rather, well, this is a call not of the error function, but of Zagier's slight variant of the error function. Um, so we define E uh, C of u. This is some kind of a complementary error function, this sort of, as in this theory. E sub C of some real variable u is twice the sine of u times the integral from 0, uh, uh, this is EC, OK, from absolute value of u to infinity, e to the minus pi t squared dt. So now, of course, what you see, let's say u is equal to 0, where sine for me of sine of 0 is 0. OK? So sine of 0 equals 0, just as a convention. But anyway, so let's suppose this weren't here. Let's leave this off. And let's suppose u was equal to 0. Then I get 1, because I've just got the usual Gaussian integral. So the 2 means I, can only I have to integrate only on one side to get a 1. And so the sign here makes this into an odd function. Okay? And it has a mate, which would be called the error function. So this is the complementary error function, which would be the analogous thing, 2 sine of u times the integral from 0 to absolute u of e to the minus pi t squared dt. Um, and you can see that if you add these two guys up, you get 1. right? Or rather, you get sine of u. So the point is that e of u plus ec of u is equal to simply sine of u. Right, because the integrals add to 1, and the sine factors out. Okay? All right, so why are we doing this? Well, the point is that what we're trying to do is to fix this difference of sine functions into something nicely decaying, and so on and so forth. And so the answer is the following. We define theta upper c of tau script c to be equal to the sum on x in mu plus l of 1 half EC of x inner product C uh, prime. And now it turns out you need a square root of 2v here, sorry, inside the function. This is the root 2 is because we've misnormalized somewhere, somebody's fault, and I don't know whose. Okay, and the root v is because we're put, this is supposed to be the quadratic uh, theta series, so it needs a v in it somewhere. And take EC of xc root 2v. And then you take here q to the q of x. Okay? So this is a somewhat analogous looking series, except now what I've done is I've replaced the sign that occurs over there with this complementary error function. 
And now the theorem, Swager's theorem is the fact that, um, so this is Swager's, theorem is that if I take the sum of these guys, this theta tau c plus this complementary guy, theta, c, theta tau like this, that this is modular of weight n plus 1, uh, sorry, n over 2, sorry, n over 2. This is modular of weight n over 2. Now notice that that isn't the same weight that Siegel would give you. Because Siegel, if I have signature n1, which is what we have here, n minus 1, 1, what Siegel would give you is n over 2 minus 1. Right? Because it would p minus q over 2 would be n over 2 minus 1. So the weight has been jacked up right, a little bit. Anyway, this is Swager's result. And so he showed that this is true. And of course, by the observation that I made here, with the sign, you can see, and in fact, I guess I made a mistake here. I'm supposed to subtract this. Okay. And the reason is when I subtract this inside, I get this guy subtracted from sign, so I'm essentially seeing this guy. So you can write the whole completed thing as a similar sum. So this guy here can be written as a sum on x in mu plus l of one half e of xc prime root 2v. Maybe I have a sign wrong again, but whatever. E of xc root 2v, q to the q of x. OK, so you can write the completed guy, you can write in terms of the error function, in terms of the, instead of complementary. OK. Um, now, as I said, one of the things that's interesting here is the fact that you start with a very beautiful, naive, classical style theta series, which isn't modular, and you fix it by this very explicit uh, extra piece, non-holomorphic piece, so that you do get a modular form. And then the other point, of course, is that if people who follow this will mock modular forms, et cetera, et cetera. So we're interested, those people are interested in modular forms where there's some clear, nice, beautiful holomorphic part, and which isn't modular, but it's, a, it's modular discrepancy. You know, there's a failure to be modular, matches that of some non-holomorphic series, so that when you add the two, you get something modular. Now, my own point of view, um, these mock modular forms, I, I, what they amount to from a more representation theoretic point of view is that the, they're automorphic representations in a weak sense. So sometimes they have bad growth, so, okay. But they correspond to extensions of irreducibles on the level of GK modules. So this modular form here is, is not, if, we, if you wrote it out, and this guy has reasonable pro growth properties because it's just a theta series, but if you look at the GK module underlying this automorphic form, it's not irreducible. It's indecomposable. And the fact that you get the holomorphic part and the other part related to each other is the two pieces, two constituents of this extension of, our, of representations. So I'm not going to say anything more about that, but that's one of the reasons that we should be, if you're interested in automorphic representations, that these are interesting objects. So is one of the pieces a highest weight module? Yes, that's why you're seeing the holomorphic piece, exactly. Okay. And in fact, in this case, the other one's also a, highest, a lowest weight module. And you get the two by taking some lowering operator. This is the, in the theory of mock modular forms, there's always this thing they call the C operator, which is lowering from the point of view of the Lie algebra action, followed by complex conjugation to make it holomorphic again. And so they view it as being two holomorphic pieces. OK. So, uh, so the background here now is, I mean, how did I get into this business? Well. So what happened was that some, some years ago, and I could probably dig out the actual date, um, I went to a conference in, at AIM in California about the mock modular forms. So I was trying to figure out what they were, and it was a conference. So I said, OK, I'll go to this conference. And so on the flight out to this conference, I was reading Zagier's Bourbaki article about mock modular forms. And in particular in there, he describes Zweger's result. And I said, huh, that's, that's, I think I know how to do that. And it's related to my theory with Milson which I'll explain to you in just a moment. And I found that, in fact, I could recover Zweger's result by doing an integral, which I did on the plane. And it's uh, one half page. And so I said, well, that's great. I put it in a drawer because it was a half page. I mean, no journal will take an article of half page, half page long. So I put it in a drawer. And so last summer, um, what happened was that um, some physicists 
published a paper where they did Zweger's theory for signature n minus 2, 2, which I'm about to describe to you. And because I had found this very slick way of deriving Zweger's results from my old work with Milson, I asked myself, gee, I wonder if this new construction, which was many, many, many pages and very elaborate, I'll describe a little bit of it to you, could be also accounted for by my old theory with Milson. And I had a very pleasant month where I worked that out and, and I was off, right? It was July. <laughs> and it was great. It all worked. Okay? And so that's what I want to describe to you, but then we can do the case of general signature. So the general signature case is some joint work with my former student, Jens Funke. Okay, so let me now describe, I'll leave this part up maybe a little bit more. Let me describe to you what the physicist uh, told us, or put in their archive paper, and then I'll try to, I'll be a little bit brief about it because I want to describe the general case afterwards, and then I'll describe how to get these this whole class of functions uh, out of my theory with Milson, um, which suggests there's both some interpretations of these sign differences, but also some more general possibilities. Okay. So A, uh, B, M, P. So this is Alexandrov uh, oh well, Alexandrov uh, Banerjee G, uh, Manshot, and Piolini. As you can see, from now on, it's going to be AVMP if I have to cite it again. Okay. Um, so in so this was last summer. They consider the case that analog, analog for signature of V is equal to n minus two two. Now, the reason I keep this is that that way the weight is always n over 2. So the weight will turn out to be n over 2 in this case as well. OK, so what did they do? So they started with a, a guy like this, and a lattice, and dual lattice, and so on and so forth. So the first thing is that you want to have some analog of the, sine, the difference of sine functions, which I carefully erased. And then you want to have some analog of this completion. So those are the two things that they introduced. OK, so first let's uh, do the analog of the sine function, or better yet, what's the analog of the pair of vectors c, c prime, which allowed us to define the wedge in the previous case. So what they consider is the following. They consider uh, two pairs of vectors, c1, c1 prime, c2, c2 prime. Now, they're physicists, so they're very clever with notation. And so really, this should be c1, c1 prime, but it turns out when you're typing, it's way faster to do it that way, I discovered. So I learned already this from the physicist. That the, okay. But in any case, I put a, a prime. It could be either on top or on the, on the index. It means the same thing. Okay. But it's much better to do it this way. Okay, so they compare. They give us two pairs of vectors. That's why they write so fast. Well, maybe. <laughs> um, but you see, I've, much, I've already spent way much more time explaining it to you than what I've lost by writing it in the traditional way. So maybe twice. Okay. And so such that, so here are the conditions. Now let's, let me also remind you, in this situation, D is going to be the oriented negative planes in VR. So this is sitting inside of the Grossmannian plane in VR. OK, such that. OK, the conditions of the vectors. So the first condition is that if I take here uh, the span, of C1 with C2, or of the span of C1 with C2 prime, these are in D. They're negative two planes. And similarly, if I use C1 prime, the span of C1 prime with C2, and the span of C1 prime with C2 prime, these are all supposed to be negative two planes. But I'm also going to put a subscript here, which I'm going to stop writing. PO means properly oriented. So in other words, the basis that I've written down here is the, ori is the correct orientation. In other words, the, this is a properly oriented basis. Okay, so now define for you four possibly identical oriented negative two planes from this collection of vectors. Okay, that's the first thing. Now the second thing is that they put on more conditions.
And when I say more conditions, you'll find many pages of possible additional conditions that would make something work and so on and so forth, which was one of the confusions I had to dig through in trying to understand this paper. And so part of what I was able to understand is that there's a better way of expressing all these conditions. Okay? So I won't write them all out because you can start writing out a bunch of conditions on gram matrices of various things. And let me just say that we start out with these. These are properly oriented. Uh, the other thing, of course, you want, well, okay, so you have these things. So now, uh, now we define a function phi2 of x, and we'll call this collection here c, as you would expect. So phi2 of xc is going to be 1 over 4, and now you take sine of xc1 minus sine of xc1 prime times sine of xc2 minus sine of x c2 prime. So it's the product of the two signs. Now I can't, I can't, I didn't ever really try to draw a picture, but clearly what should be going on here is that this should be defining some analog of that wedge. All right? But of course the difference now is that this, the space D and the space V are now divorced from each other. In the hyperbolic space, the D can be viewed as sitting inside of VR, but now they're just totally different spaces. One is in the Grassmannian, one is the vector space. So they're not sitting inside of each other anymore. And so you start to see that there's a world going on in both of them. There's something going on in V, because that's where we want to do our sum. And there's something going on in the Grassmannian, which is where we have these points. Okay. So you make this, this function like this, and then you do the analog of the sum that we had in the previous case. So we make some kind of a theta of tau c, which is equal to the sum on x in mu plus l, all the notation remains the same, phi sub 2 of xc times q to the q of x. Okay? So it's analogous sum. Now, one of the things that's in their paper is that when they put on these many, many conditions, they eventually are able to show that under all these conditions, that series is termwise absolutely convergent and therefore defines a holomorphic not really modular form, all right? Um, and I, as I said, I'm going to come back and explain a better way of, of thinking about that point, so I'm not going to repeat all these conditions. So anyway, this, they show that this is convergent, so it's a holomorphic series in, in tau. Defines a holomorphic thing. But of course, as we already saw in this Wager's case, you don't expect this to be a modular form. You have to correct it. So that's the other big contribution that they make in this paper, they write down how to correct this guy. Okay, in order to do that, you need some generalization of these error functions. And this is why the, hence the term, generalized error functions. So they call them generalized error functions. So let me just write down uh, maybe the general, I can't remember how much time, I, okay. I don't have too much time, so I have to go quickly here. So I'm gonna compress the story a little bit and tell you already what E sub Q is, okay? 20 minutes, okay, very good. So let's jump a slight bit ahead and let's, suppose, let's consider the case of general signature, PQ. And I'm gonna define the, general, the er generalized error function in that context, and then of course you could take Q equal two to get the one I need over here, okay? So there's gonna be a function, um, the generalized error function, E sub Q, and now what is it going to be a function of? Well, I'm going to take here a collection of vectors, C1, these are small c's, supposedly, C sub Q, such that the span is Z, which is in D. This is an oriented negative Q plane. You see where I'm jumping ahead in the story, Q for general Q. So you suppose you have a collection spanning a negative Q plane, so now you put C1 through CQ here. It's now a function of X, all right? And here's what it is. You take the integral over the, over the negative Q plane Z of E to the pi, and now you take the inner product, you project um, X into the Q plane Z and subtract it from Y, Y minus PR ZX, you put this in the exponent, notice there's a, no minus sign here because it's negative definite. Okay, so that's a, usual, that's a Gaussian type integral. 
And down here, what you do is you take the sine of x, of, sorry, y, c1, times the sine of y, c2, times the sine of y, c q, dy. And what's true here is that this dy is normalized so that if you just took the exponential integral, you get 1. In other words, the integral over z, e to the pi, y, y, dy is equal to 1. That tells you how you normalize the measure. Okay. So there it is. Now, it's a, an amusing little exercise to check that for q equals 1, it comes down to what we already had. Okay, so I'll leave it. It's a, it's a trivial calculus exercise, but it's fun. Anyway, this is the generalized error function. And so what they uh, showed was that you can make a, com a correction to this thing in terms of this generalized error function. Okay. And it turns out to be modular, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So now, in order to try to get the whole talk into the time allotted, uh, I'm going to jump ahead and discuss how you get all of these functions out of my old work with Milson, and, and there should be more, which we don't know about yet. Okay. okay. So now we're going back to Maryland back in the day when Zaghi and I were talking about theta functions, and John Milson and I eventually worked on these things. So let's look at the Gaussian for a moment. So you remember that we had, when we did this majorant, we have this basic function phi zero of x, which is equal to e to the minus pi x x sub z. This is the majorant that we had before. And I'm writing it without any taus, et cetera, et cetera, because of course I can always act on this guy by the ve representation of uh, the, the action of the ve representation on the Schwartz function part, where this guy is 1 u 1 v to the 1 half, v to the minus 1 half, and those in the know realize that I'm just putting in the group dependence uh, here. I'm sorry for pointing. Yeah. Again, x and y. Where, here? Yes. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm going to integrate over this q plane. All right? So what I do is I'm subtracting the projection of x in the q plane. So x is some vector in v now, vr. Yeah, y, I'm integrating over dz, right? I'm integrating over z. I'm integrating, y is a parameter in, in this q-plane, okay? I'm just integrating over the q-plane, dy. dy is the Euclidean measure on there, except normalized so that the, this quadratic form gives me 1, okay? And then I put the signs of y here. So this is some walls, right? Okay. Sorry? Y is in the q-plane, yeah. So let me write it here, y in z, okay? dy. Okay, so this is the Gaussian, and now notice that what's true here, yeah, yeah, somebody, Saul is supposed to, has been telling me this, but I haven't been paying attention to him. <laughs> okay, so writing it a little bit bigger, <laughs> just, just for you and just this once, okay. <laughs> It'll be smaller again in a moment. Okay, <laughs> um, so I'm thinking of the Gaussian now as depending on x and z. So I think of it as a function of two parameters. If I think of it that way, I can think of the Gaussian as a, an element of the Schwartz space of VR, because, but valued in the smooth functions on D. All right? And I can also realize the equivariance property, the obvious equivariance that this thing has, means it's invariant under the group G, where G is O of, of VR. Okay? It's invariant under the orthogonal group. So if you act simultaneously here, nothing changes. Okay. So, so this is what the Gau this is what Siegel's theta function was built out of. And what Milson and I found were, uh, was an analogous thing, which I write as phi km, just to distinguish it. It's going to be a Schwartz function on VR, but now it's valued in the smooth Q forms on D. And it has the same invariance property under the orthogonal group. This is what we found. And thanks to Roger help we found this, I should say. Uh, it's a long part of the story. In any case, we found a guy like this. So this is a Schwartz function valued in differential forms. And it has a couple of important properties. The, one of the most important ones is the fact that it's closed. So d of phi km is equal to 0, where d is the exterior derivative over here. Okay, so as a differential form, it's closed. Um, the other thing about it is that it has weight 
plus q over 2, which means that if I form a theta series out of it, I get a modular form of weight p plus q over 2, or if I acted by the orthogonal SO2 tilde, whatever, I would see that eigenvalue. Okay? So we have this guy like this. And so what we can do in this situation for general signature is we can make the theta form which is completely analogous to what we've done before, theta, say, mu, tau, uh, phi km, which is the sum, you know, I need a v to the q over 2, x in mu plus l, and now here I put omega g prime tau uh, phi km of x. Okay? So I sum this guy over the lattice, and of course, when I get done summing this thing, this is now a a smooth Q form on D, which is, uh, which is actually gamma L invariant because we formed the theta, theta series. So it's a, not only a differential form on D, it's closed. It's a closed smooth Q form on D, which is gamma L invariant, which is why Milson and I were studying it, because we were interested in cohomology of arithmetic groups. And now you can take the cohomology class, and there's a long, long story associated to that. Um, and it has weight as a theta series. It has weight, as I said, p plus q over 2. Okay, so Milson and I, as I said, there's a long story about applying this for cohomology of arithmetic groups, but now I want to do something different, all right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply take this guy, and I'm going to suppose that I have S. Hmm. Okay, I might suppose. Let's see if I can find another one that works. Otherwise, the talk might be over. Uh, S of, I'm going to find, define some cycle inside of D, which is an or, a, a Q cell. In other words, an oriented Q simplex, or something like that. Just so inside, I'm putting C here, anticipating what's going to actually happen. I could take any S, and I can consider the integral over S, let's just say S is this, of this phi km of x. Now, of course, I could integrate the whole theta series, but because this is beautifully termwise absolutely convergent, it suffices to integrate this thing and then make a theta series afterwards. Okay? So let's suppose that this cell here is compact. Because then, even better, when I do this integral here, it's still a Schwartz function. I've simply removed the form part. I'm taking some projection, some kind of, some kind of exotic Schwartz function. So I can make theta series out of this, and I'll get theta series of weight p plus q over 2, and so on and so forth. Okay. So I, I want to consider these integrals for various s. All right. So here's a supply of S, okay? So let's consider a collection C, which is a collection of pairs, C1, C1 prime, C2, C2 prime, dot, 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 CQ, CQ prime. And by the way, this or suggestion is already in this paper. They already suggested that we should take this data, but they don't suggest why. That's the point. They're just taking some data, and they can make that sign function. All right? But here's the why. So I take these guys like this, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to let, um, I'm going to take a parameter s in 0, 1 to the q. So of course what I would like, and what they will tell us is the very first step in their long series of conditions, is they would like each one of, each triple that you get by choosing one out of the pairs spans an oriented negative q-plane. All right? That's the first thing you want. But I'm going to express that in a different way. So I choose a parameter in 0, 1 q powers, and I let a b of s be the, the frame, which I get by taking 1 minus s1 c1 plus s1 c1 prime, comma, and so on. C, sorry, <clears throat> 1 minus sq cq plus sq cq prime. So all I'm doing is I'm just taking inside the vector space, I have in, inside of V, I've got a bunch of pairs of negative vectors, and I'm just joining them up by the, the straight line joining them. S is, S is a real number. So this is just in 0, 1. They lie between 0 and 1. So I'm just taking the, the, the line, the convex line between the two. Okay? I consider this. Okay? And so here's a definition. C, this collection, is in good position.
if um, th this collection here, I can take the span, I don't know how to say it, span of this collection of Q vectors of BS, PO, is in D for all S in 0, 1 to the Q. In other words, I want it to be true that if I take this Q-tuple for any values of the parameters in 0, 1, that those things span a negative Q-plane. And it's, of course, properly oriented. Uh, that's the condition. So in particular, if you take the vertices of the square here, or the cube here, you would get the corners. right? And so each, each Q-tuple where I choose one of these has to be a negative Q-plane. That's included in this condition. But more, they also all have to lie on the same connected component, because after all, this is a continuous deformation. All right? Um, so this is, the, this is the hypothesis. OK. And so maybe, how much time do I have left? Three minutes? Three to five? OK, a few minutes. <clears throat> OK, so I'm going to erase the definition of the guy here. So, um, so here's the, the, the result. OK? So in any case, if I have, notice that if I have this good position condition, then in, per, in particular what I get is a map from 0, 1 to the Q into D by just sending any parameter s to the span of this. So I get a map. Now, of course, all the c1s could be equal to the c1 primes, in which case I just get a point, right? I mean, I might, instead of having pairs, I'm just redundant. I have c1 equals c1 prime, c2 equals c2 prime, and so on. I actually only had q vectors, and I tried to cheat you. Um, I would just get a point, but nonetheless, I get a map. Okay. And so, um, well, okay, so let me tell, state the theorem in two pieces here. So what I'd like to do is I would like to take this kind of an integral here. I can now do this integral for this S, so we can think of this as S. This is an oriented Q simplex inside of D, and so I can compute the integral of phi km over that. And so this is the theorem. Okay, um, so let's see, oh, right, did I write it here in the notes? Okay. I have to change page, sorry. It's easy enough to remember, but I'm tired, so, okay, here we go. So this integral, which I write as the, well, just make a notation, the integral over S of C, because it depends on C, of phi km of X is equal to 2 to the minus Q, kind of summation over I, now, i is going to be a subset of the, of the parameters 1 through q. And so c upper i, as you can imagine, is just the collection c1 upper i, cq upper i, where if i, if the index is not in the collection, I don't put a prime. And if the index is in the collection, I put a prime. OK? So those are the possibilities. So I'm a summing on this. And I have a minus 1 to the power absolute value of i minus 1, and then e sub q of c, um, where is it, ah, c upper i, c upper i is now a perfectly good argument for the generalized error function of, and now we have x root 2, um, okay, that's the answer, uh, times e to the minus 2 pi q of x, that's what I have in my notes, okay, okay. So in other words, what happens is that this integral of this phi km over this, I'll call it a, a q cube, although it may degenerate, um, is just given by the sum of the generalized error function at the vertices. OK, that's, that's the answer. OK, this is an elaborate calculation, very elaborate, and it's done by induction, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, as a corollary of this, because if I, if I take the integral over this same thing, of this theta function, theta mu of tau phi km, what I get is a modular form which is basically given by this sum. Okay? And so for q equals 1, I get Zweger's completion. And for q equals 2, I get a, b, m, p. So I get exactly their completions in this way. And um, OK. So let me just maybe say in words the last few uh, consequences here. Um, 
So if I take this series here, and let's put a Q here. This is sneaky, I realize, but I'm doing it, okay? If I take this series here, now the sign, I just have to put more dots here. So let me put some little dots here and put a Q here. That's the sine function. So I just take the product of differences of signs, right, all the way through the last one. Um, this thing here is, in this conditions, if C is good position, so all I'm assuming is a good position, then this is termwise absolutely convergent, defines a holomorphic thing. You just need to use good position, that's all, okay? And moreover, what's true is, so this won't be a modular form, but this is its completion. And one way of seeing that, so maybe I'll even stop here, well, what, two more things. Um, you see, if I look at this error function, and I look at the asymptotics, let me put Tx in here for some t, positive t, and let t go to infinity, all right? What I claim is I get just this sine of the x of x, okay? And here's the point. The point is that if I do a change of variables, what I'm going to have here is an e to the pi y y, and down here I get sine of y1 with uh, plus uh, p y p z p r z of x comma c1 dot dot dot. So all I did is I changed variables. But now if I had a t here, let's say I had put a tx, sorry about the notation, and I let t go to infinity, this term simply dominates that sign. And so this becomes constant. As soon as t is big enough, it's just constant. And it factors out. The remaining integral is 1. And so you see what's true is that this function as a function of x is asymptotic to the, the, just the product of these signs for the x here. Okay? And so this alternating sum that I'm seeing here, if you think about it, is asymptotic to this. And that's the sense in which it's a completion. Okay? So the final thing I'd say uh, as I realize I'm running short of time. So here I've defined this sort of Q cube. So let's draw in the case Q equals 2. What it'll look like is something like this. There are some vertices here. The actual region in question is like this. All right. And now associated to X is a thing I call DX, which is the set of all Z in D, such that R of XZ is equal to 0. In other words, i.e. x is perpendicular to z. Okay? Now, if x is a positive vector, that's a divisor, or has codimension, sorry, codimension q inside the whole thing. If x is not positive definite, it's empty. Okay? And so what happens is that, um, essentially what happens is there, there could be at most point, one point of intersection of this gadget with this square. And so you can compute this integral here by Stokes' theorem, or Stokes' theorem with a point removed. And then finally, what you find is that this strange sign combination over here is the local intersection number of dx with the cycle. And so this uh, thing that you're completing over here um, is just the sum of the actual intersection numbers. This series automatically converges holomorphically. I, there's a quick proof, which I won't take time to show you. So you recover their various results. And I, the only thing I should say is, in conclusion, is just that this square is a very special square because any two vertices share at least one basis vector. Whereas you can imagine the generic Q cube, or the generic square for that matter. I mean, here, you could consider a generic square. And I have no idea. We can certainly define a theta series by integrating over the generic square. I have no idea what it is. So anyway, that's stuff there. Well, I guess, I guess what's true is that, I mean, well, I would say that there are two pieces to the answer. One is that, I mean, this series is very attractive, maybe to some of us, but this series actually comes up in string theory. So in other words, this series, literally, this series comes up in calculations of string theory, and it comes up in certain questions in moduli spaces of sheaves on projective spaces, et cetera, et cetera. So these kind of things do come up in, in, phys in various mathematical problems. Let me call them mathematical problems because it's not really physics. Let's be honest. Okay. So, so these, things, these kind of series do actually arise. 
And the fact that they're not modular but they can be corrected is then a significant fact. Okay? So that's one reason. And for me, the second reason is the one I mentioned before, and that is that these objects here are kind of mock modular in the sense that, you see, this is a nice holomorphic series. And so it, when I complete this thing, there's a holomorphic part and a non-holomorphic part. If I take d bar, it will kill this part and give me another piece, which will then be modular. And that's what they call a shadow in this theory of mock modular forms. And so this, the fact that these are such beautiful numbers, these intersection numbers, rather typical. In other words, in the theory of mock modular forms, it's very typical you have some kind of a series which has some holomorphic part and a non-holomorphic part, neither of which is modular by itself. It's modular altogether. When you apply the d-bar operator, you kill the holomorphic part. The remaining part is a more mundane modular form, which you've lifted back into this kind of mock modular world or this other world. And then often the Fourier coefficients of the holomorphic part, which were lost under the shadow, are interesting. And there are many examples where there's deep arithmetic information in those pieces. And so here, I don't know, that's not deep arithmetic information, but it's at least intersection numbers of little patches on, on these symmetric spaces with these cycles. Right? So there's some kind of uh, nice geometric information anyway. There are examples where you see arithmetic geometry type information floating in here. So that's the other reason. That they're, they're exa they give examples of extensions in the space of automorphic forms which have some, seem to have some arithmetic significance. Questions? Okay. Thanks. Thanks.